Hello, everyone. I'm Lindsay Hunter. I was Lindsay Eaves during the 2013 Rising Star expedition, and I am one of the six original underground astronauts. And could you tell us, Lindsay, how that name came to be? I'm sorry? Could you tell us how that name, the Underground Astronauts, came to, came oh, the into under, being? The Underground Astronauts, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the, the name comes from the idea that we're, we're working in an area that was somewhat remote from the rest of sort of society. It's actually very interesting to me because what I found is I'm also very passionate about other different kinds of sciences and one of the things that I follow is a lot of the Mars exploration um, that they're trying to push forward in the future. And the, uh, the scientists that actually are going to be going to Mars train in underground caves and they're called the underground astronauts as well. I don't think that's necessarily where our name came from, but I think it's very apt because as any caver can tell you, once you're underground, you're in one of the two most remote environments that you can be in on the planet Earth, whether you're under the ocean or you're under the crust of the Earth itself. You're so far away from everyone else that you might as well be on the surface of the moon. Well, so how did you wind up um, finding your way into this sort of space program underground, um, if we might call it that? Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you found out about Rising Star and how you eventually got down to South Africa? Well, the beginning was, I imagine, rather prosaically by wasting time on Facebook. Uh, I saw a Facebook ad that was posted by uh, Professor Lee Berger and it was advertising in a way that was very reminiscent for me of the Shackleton um, exploration in Antarctica, where it's a hazardous journey, safe passage, uh, and uh, return doubtful. And it had that sort of flavor of you know, exploration. We need these kinds of paleoanthropologists who also have skills in excavation but that was where ordinary ended. Then they were also looking for caving skills or experience. Climbing experience was also listed as a plus. Couldn't be afraid of small spaces. Had to work well in teams and had to be available on very short notice. And all of those things were very intriguing, very tantalizing to me and told me that there was something very special in the works. And I immediately thought actually of a friend and posted it and tagged him. And Lee uh, thanked me for posting. And I said in the comments section, actually, Lee, I, I think possibly I might be able to do this now that I'm looking at it. And he said, well, great, you know, send your, send your details and we'll see. And it was a few days later that I ended up getting an email back that they were interested in having a Skype call or Skype interview with me. And we're going to be sending a little bit more information so that they could see whether or not this was a good fit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. And so how long from that Skype interview until you wound up actually being on the ground in South Africa was it? Gosh, it was very fast. It was a matter of it was a matter of a couple of weeks uh, because I actually I found holy goodness my passport has expired. So <laughs> the the first order of business was uh, I was in Austin at the time was having to uh, drive uh, down I think I, I think I went to Dallas. Um, to the passport office to expedite my passport and have it done the same day, which was it was exciting and nerve-wracking and very. I, the speed of the expedition was something. Uh, the the way that it moved was very very quick, which is not something that we're used to in paleoanthropology, where we work generally on a geological time scale. <laughs> so 
things move very, very slowly, and that includes funding. And a lot of the research is very painstaking. So I was very excited by the pace because that told me that there was something very important happening. Now, my guess before I, I spoke with Lee was that it was some sort of uh, recovery related to there was a disaster or something that whatever remains they were wanting to excavate were threatened physically and that they needed to be moved immediately. Uh, we get that, you know, in cultural resource management in the United States where, you know, there's a cell tower going in. It's an emergency. We have to save this. I was, I thought possibly it was something on that order. When I saw the photos, however, I, I was astonished by the quantity of material that was visible on the surface and the the quality of that material and I knew that was why we were moving so quickly. And so you then arrive in South Africa and you're kind of tossed into this project with five other women that you had never met before if I'm correct? That is correct. I, I, the first thing you do is paleoanthropology is very small. First you look at the names you're like, I don't know any of these people. But the, the first scary, scary thing was coming, coming down and one of the first people you meet is Becca Pichotto, who is like, <laughs> like fits in a box. And you go, oh goodness, I, I feel like I am way too big. I felt like a giant. And I, I thought, I really screwed up. I am like, I'm way too big for this. Like, she scared the crap out of me. <laughs> now, now, but I imagine there were um, measures taken to make sure that you weren't too big before you got down there. I imagine yes, that was we, part of the the yeah we, out. we we all we all uh, we all took our, our measures and that's actually uh, somewhat of a joke. I heard later that uh, Vilma, who is Lee's secretary, was actually deluge with um, the inbox of you know these young women who were sending these cover letters that are saying strange things like. You know, hi, I, I work, I get along really well with people. I have a really great personality and I'm available and here are my measurements and here's my picture. And she's like, uh, Lee, what, it, what is this that you're doing? But yeah, a lot of us, um, in, in talking to some of the other scientists, so prepare, we prepare by doing things like I was crawling under my bed and um, crawling through hangers and, you know, of course, <laughs> taking my measurements. And I can tell you that there is no greater diet, there is no greater paleo diet than the rising star paleo diet. The wanting to be <laughs> on that team and fit through that slot is highly motivating. And how did it feel when you finally got down there and were able to get through those slots? Because for those in our audience who may not know, um, you were dealing with having to go through extended stretches where you're talking eight to ten inches of width. So once we, we finally made it to to the shoot and it was my, my moment to, to go through, I felt a little bit better by knowing that um, several of the other women had gone first. <laughs> and and sort of sizing myself up against them going, okay, I think, I think I'll fit too. Because my biggest fear was literally that I was going to be flown halfway across the world and not fit. Not fear for my life or limb or injury. It was, I was just not going to fit. And that was going to be a really stupid end to But finally you know moving through 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 the shoot 
you don't know exactly how fast you're going to move through it, whether you know you're in time, and, and you finally find that you just sort of controlled fall, that you just sort of slip, 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 and 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 let me interrupt you for a moment. Yeah. Am I correct? Just for, again to give folks who may not be familiar with the layout of the cave, the chute that you're talking about is the 30 plus foot vertical drop down into the fossil chamber itself. Yeah, that's the, uh, the, the 12 meter sort of drop um, before it opens out above uh, four meters of literally drop, where it just like opens. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, once we were um, going in for the excavation, they had actually put a ladder at the bottom of the chute. So it was a little less harrowing, I imagine, than for Stephen Tucker and, and Rick, who once they first went through, they just literally dropped out of the air, sort of like uh, Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> but uh, we, we dropped out on top of Rick or Stephen uh, the, the first uh, time or two as they would sort of help us to know where our feet were. Because you can't actually see where you're going. Your feet are completely ob obstructing you. It's a very Alice in Wonderland down the rabbit hole feeling. <laughs> and so, so tell us, if you will, some of your experiences um, working down as you excavated the fossils, because there was a lot to learn once you were actually in the fossil chamber, am I correct? Yes, so once we first were in the chamber, it was sort of a triage situation. Um, we had a lot of loose remains on the surface and we found that as we walked around that it, there was a kind of bioturbation. We were actually churning up more fossils, which was really amazing at first and quickly became really annoying. Um, you've never seen so much happy swearing uh, among scientists that, oh crap, it's another bone. <laughs> you know, because just when, just when you thought you'd cleared a, a, a nice uh, surface that you were uh, free and safe to, to walk over, something popped out of it. And it wasn't even just like something small. It was like large bones were popping out of the floor. And it almost sounds like you were working on a jigsaw puzzle and you clear an area and then there's more jigsaw puzzle pieces underneath it. Yes. Yeah. And actually, we, we ended up working our way to what we then ended up calling the puzzle box because oh. it was one of the highest uh, accumulations or densities of that we could see along the surface. And we found that as we were removing uh, some of the elements that they, they were sort of stacked one upon the other. And it was sort of like pickup sticks or Jenga. Uh, of a paleoanthropological nature, that we were having to very carefully um, extract them from one another uh, as we went down. We were we were also taking down at the same time as these bones because you don't just pull bones out of the ground. Uh, we were doing a careful sondage uh, through. However, could you that so word we were you just actually use sondage taking, for our. Um audience that may not be familiar with that word. So, so what we were actually doing is we're, we're taking the sediment down, um, trying to take it down at, uh, at even levels um, without just pulling the bones uh, down. But there were so many bones that it was, it was very difficult to take out the sediment because there wasn't as much sediment uh, sometimes as there were bones. And that uh, was the area that we called then the puzzle box, and that was the main concentration that we we worked on um, in November of 2013. That was the focus of the actual excavations. We had along uh, an area that was nearby it that we were referring to amongst ourselves as you know, the the tooth fairies hoard um, <laughs> because there were there were so many teeth that it, it looked like it was. Uh, there was much more teeth than there really was anything else. Um, and that was it in an adjacent um, area. But those were sort of the main areas that we were 
that we were working in. Uh, it was, it's, it's a very interesting thing because you're, you get very used to you know, just focusing into the work that you're doing and you stand up and smack your head on an overhang uh, on a rock. So when you would watch uh, anyone else do the um, over the cameras, because we had cameras on us at all times, it was like being in the Big Brother house or something. Um, which is very nerve-wracking to have your boss essentially watching you at all times. It's, um, it's like being on the security camera. But we would constantly just smack our heads. And I actually, you, you end up having the problem later that you're so used to wearing a helmet for hours and hours of work that once I would actually come above ground, I would end up smacking my head on everything. <laughs> because I wouldn't pay attention to where my head was because it was usually protected. Oh, that's funny. Now, actually, I want to ask a question. There's one, at least in anthropological circles, one famous photo that you are the subject of, um, of you sitting on a ledge up above the um, the fossil chamber with a laptop. And yes. um, can you tell us a little bit about what um, what was going on with that that photo? Because I think a lot of people will see it once the announcement's made. It's kind of an iconic photo of the uh, of the expedition, and it'd be nice for for folks to have some background on that. That is an outstanding photo that I cannot take credit for, except for the fact that I was just sitting there. Uh, that was actually an award-winning photo that was taken by another one of the excavator uh, scientists, uh, the underground astronauts, Ellen, and. I believe she actually she won a um, award uh, with that photo. It was just amazing. Um, what what she's captured in that moment is um, we had our um, white light strobe scanner that we were using to scan the um, the excavation site so that. During the course of excavation, that's what we, um, in archaeology we recognize that that's also the act of destroying a site um, in a very real sense. And so the way that you mitigate that or you deal with that reality is you have very, very careful documentation. Now because of the limitations within the cave that we were working, we had to get a little bit creative with the way that we recorded things. And one of the uh, innovations that was used was this white light strobe scanner, which I believe it had a high fidelity to like below a millimeter. And so what we were able to do was we would scan the surface. It looked essentially like a giant white iron, <laughs> um, like one of those steam irons, which is not very glamorous, but you would essentially, if you imagine holding a, a steam iron, <laughs> Over over a surface, and it shh, the the steam comes out and covers it. We're doing that with light. We're bathing the entire surface of the excavation in um, this light. And as we do that, it's actually creating a 3D image. It's capturing 3D data regarding uh, the site and how the fossils are positioned. And so one of us would have to very carefully move the scanner over uh, the excavation area that we were working um, before we would remove anything so that we had the, the position in place. And uh, another person would then sit at the computer uh, on the laptop out of the way and they would monitor uh, the progress to make sure that there was even coverage of the entire area and that everything was uh, registered properly. We did run into some constraints with the fact of uh, distance, how far the scanner could get away, and how close it had to be. And we're obviously working in a very confined space. And so we would fight, fight with that sometimes. And so you, thus the very grim and uh, focused look uh, on my face as I'm making sure that that's being covered well because it's one of the most important 
um, parts of paleoanthropology and archaeology is that context. Without the context of where the elements or specimens came from and how they were positioned, we lose valuable information about how the site was formed. And so that was something that was crucial to the success of the expedition. And I imagine it's also critical in addition, obviously, to what you said, the fact that so few people will ever be able to get into that fossil chamber to see it for themselves. This is going to be the hands-on view that a lot of people who are doing the analysis get to see. Yes. One, one very exciting part of this is that because of the work that uh, Ashley Kruger, who is um, working, um, I believe his dissertation uh, focuses on the, the technological aspects of, of the site and of the expedition. Through his expertise and through the work that we were able to do with the scanner, what we're able to accomplish is we can redig the site in a very real way. So you can actually place all the sediment back, all the fossils back. Um, you can, you know, put Pandora's, uh, you know, wonders back in the box <laughs> and take them back out again. Um, any number of ways and in any number of directions. So it actually is, I think, something that you're going to be seeing a lot more in the future as it becomes more available. It's it's still expensive and it's still um, somewhat in its infancy, infancy, but I think that the ability to, you know, come at your site and redig it in multiple directions and dimensions, um, any number of times, is something that's going to be very valuable uh, moving forward. And, and I think also allowing other researchers with open access to look at what you did and see it with fresh eyes and from a fresh perspective certainly will be helpful. Yes, yeah. that's that's always the that's always the goal of any archaeological or paleoanthropological excavation with the very careful notes. It's just that we've been able to essentially you know, boost, like amplify the amount of data that you're able to have so that rather than, you know, a you know, and uh, having a, a black and white picture, suddenly it's like HD, you know, color, that it, it's just amplified. Right, and, and to, to a much greater uh, resolution, I imagine, if we're talking less than a millimeter. It's, it's incredible resolution, and it also allows us to do fun things that you don't normally uh, do, which is we're able to create fly-throughs of the site for lay people to explore. Um, there is a possibility um, in the future of being able to actually recreate uh, the site um, in um, actual physical materials for people to pass through, like they've done with some of uh, the caves in France. They've recreated uh, them using um, 3D technology so that people that would not otherwise be able to visit them because of the possible harm that would come to the actual site are now going to be able to have that experience for themselves. Well, that's great. And I think that's very exciting. That is. So lo lots for us to uh, experience ahead here in the future that way. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious. Um, for you, what would you say were your, your true highlights of this uh, expedition? I know um, there, there were probably some that were... Um, very much professional, and others that were perhaps uh, personal, if you're willing to tell us some, some of those stories. Yeah. Um, obviously, this is, this uh, the Rising Star Expedition was, you know, the chance of a lifetime uh, for, you know, career, personally. I actually came to the expedition during a time in my life where I was very, very close to walking away from paleoanthropology um, and have not been able to step away because it's just, you know, it. there's so much to love about it because if you're interested in life and you're interested in people, it's the kind of discipline that just 
it keeps on opening your eyes to different facets of, you know, the world around you. And my mother had told me, um, I had just moved actually to Texas. My mother had told me when I arrived there in August that by November, and Thanksgiving, I was going to have something to be very thankful <laughs> for. And I did not think that was going to be the case. I was not in a very happy place. And to find myself that November in South Africa on a unbelievable fossil expedition of this caliber was, it would have been enough. Um, we're, I'm, I'm actually, I'm Jewish and we're, we're moving into, uh, the high holidays here right. and they have a, a saying that where they say, Dayenu, that, you know, if, um, if, uh, if the Lord had, had brought them from, you know, Egypt, it would have been enough that if he had done all these things, it would have been enough, but there was more and there was more. And for me, it was, if I had ended up in. South Africa, it would have been enough. But there was more. There, If there had been one fossil skeleton, it would have been enough. But there was more. Uh, Dianu. And if it had just been an amazing scientific exploration, it would have been enough. But I was also lucky enough that I met my husband, uh, Rick Hunter, who is one of the original fossil discoverers, along with Stephen Tucker which, you know, it would have been enough. But I have now moved to South Africa. Uh, we were married in December of 2014. Congratulations. And, thank you. And I have now been living in South Africa uh, since uh, the end of March of 2015. It would have been enough. Um, and now we are also expecting our first little caver for those really, really hard to get to places in Rising Star. Um, so in January, we will start our family. Well, and even it would have been enough, but I'm sure there's more. Wow, what great news. Thank you. And thank you for sharing yeah. it with us here. I have a feeling you so, may wind up getting a whole bunch of uh, congratulations as the world hears about this. Yeah, well, so thank you. Um, it's, it's just blessings upon blessings. Um, and I'm, I would have been so thrilled with Rising Star Expedition and I would have followed it just as you have. And I would have, it would have been enough to have, <laughs> to have that, to just have it, you know, be out there to be part of it and to have my life transformed in this way is you know, beyond my imagination. Well, and you have you have been so great about giving back as well. One thing I can I can speak to personally is your willingness during the excavations back in 2013 to share with us and to record your Akio skull memoir, if I can call it that, and yeah. send it to me. <laughs> it was late late at night here in Texas, so I could have it for class the next morning to share it. You know, 12 hours. 24 hours out of the ground, and my students are hearing the firsthand account of that, which is, by the way, on, on my blog as well. Um, and then even better, once you got back from South Africa in January of 2014, you made the drive from Austin to Dallas to, to come and spend the day with us. Um, and how great it was to have you know a pizza party with you and all the students. <laughs> That's a day that, that is still talked about here at St. Mark's. And so you've really gone the extra mile, literally and figuratively, for this. It was truly my my pleasure. And I think that that's, you know, from all the interviews that you've collected for people from the Rising Star Expedition, I think that that's not actually extraordinary amongst, you know, everyone. That everyone who has been involved in Rising Star Expedition has had this feeling that we can't keep it to ourselves, that it has to be something that's shared. And I think everyone has like for their own ways to do that. I talk a lot, so <laughs> it, it was easy for me to 
to come and I love to do outreach and I love uh, working with um, younger students and and so that's one way that I've tried to give back but I think that um, I remember John Hawks you know speaking to me during the expedition and, and saying there's only one way that you you get out like one way that like you would not be included with this anymore and that's if you don't share you know that's sort of I don't know it's the ethic of rising star expedition that you share and yes and clearly that that has been my experience um, that feeling like through my willingness to share your your stories to a, a wider audience I've been welcomed into the family if you will um, and it's just an amazing situation and I can't thank you enough I know um, we need to wrap up because you, it's late there in South Africa and I appreciate you spending um, so much time with us but are there any final notes things you'd like people to know about Rising Star that they might not otherwise know from the standard media or the the quick stories people tend to hear I think for me the most important part of Rising Star is just keeping in mind that there's so many amazing discoveries that are ahead of any and all of us that it's using whatever particular talent or interest that you might have that you use that and if you push that you're gonna find something it's when you keep your eyes open there's something new all around you and that the people that you know made the initial discovery they didn't have any particular you know skill in the science what they had was a driving curiosity and that was you know that was something that hadn't brought you know decades of scientists down there who were working all in that same area and so I think also that you can keep in mind related to this the amazing find at Malapa um, with Matthew Berger you know as a nine-year-old finding the fossil uh, Sadiba that you don't have to wait to grow up to make amazing discoveries. You don't have to wait to get a fancy degree to find those discoveries. Go do it. And, you know, no one can argue with the results. If you're able to accomplish something, you, you know, that's yours and that's something to, to share with the world. We're all just conduits. All we're doing is we're all, we're all sharing our eyes and ears with the better picture of the world around us. Well, great. That that's a great message. I think um, you know. I think we can all uh, tie in with the "go do it" attitude here. So, Lindsay, I want to thank you tremendously for your time today. And thank you. We really appreciate it. And um, certainly, if the opportunity presents itself, we'd love to be able to uh, Skype in with you from class at some point once the um, announcement yes. is made, which will be um, mm -hmm. later this week. So. Mm -hmm. Big excitement that way. So thanks a lot, and we look forward to catching up with you down the road a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No, and I re uh, look forward to hearing about the discoveries that your students and all the other students that might see this that they make. Great. Well, thanks a lot, and have a great one. Okay. Cheers. Cheers.